from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. Uh, my name is Patrick Anderson. I review fiction for the Washington Post, and everybody at the Post is very proud to be part of this great festival and very grateful to all of you book lovers for making it so successful. Uh, I've been asked to inform you that the Library of Congress may be filming today for uh, their website and archives. Um, so please be mindful of this as you enjoy the presentation and don't get in front of the cameras back there and if you're you know, on the run from the law or anything, cover your head. Uh, but I'm sure you're not. Um, our next speaker, Sarah Dessen, is one of America's most admired authors of young adult fiction. Her 10 novels, including What Happened to Goodbye, Someone Like You, and Long for the Ride, have been called unforgettable, powerful, and amazing by reviewers, and have won dozens of national awards. I think Sarah was probably born to be a writer. She grew up in Chapel Hill, where her parents taught at the University of North Carolina. Her mother was a classicist. Her father taught Shakespeare. So as you can imagine, there were a lot of books around the house. And she became a reader at a very early age of, uh, I don't know, four or five. And by the age of eight, she was an aspiring writer who was pecking away at her own typewriter. By high school, her enthusiasms included the novels of Judy Bloom and the music of Pink Floyd. We were discussing Pink Floyd. She's not sure that today's young people know who they are, so we won't pursue that. Uh, some of Right, right, young man. Uh, there's a well-educated young man. Sarah went on to uh, major in creative writing at the University of North Carolina. And upon graduation, instead of seeking a respectable job, she decided that she would write a novel and support herself as a waitress. Her plan succeeded brilliantly. She sold her first novel three years after graduation, and she's never looked back. Uh, there's a lot more to her story. It's all fascinating, and she can tell it better than I, better than I can. It's a great pleasure to introduce Sarah Dessen. Hello. Gosh, thanks, you guys, so much for coming out. This is awesome. I've never been able to come to this festival before, and I'm so glad to be here with lovers of books like myself. Um, um, I actually lived in Arlington, Virginia for about a year when I was in first grade. And I think that was probably the last time I was here on the mall. Um, so it's a great thing to be back. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out. And um, I was told that I could read, but I'm not going to read because I figure you guys can all read the book on your own. Um, so I'm just going to talk for a minute about writing for young adults, and then I'm hoping that we can just do questions and answers, because I think that's a lot more interesting. And I can stand up here and babble forever, um, and I've been known to do that before. But um, basically, I write for teenagers because I fell into it sort of backwards by accident. Um, we were talking about Pink Floyd earlier. I was kind of a mess in high school, I'll be upfront about that. Um, I was kind of the black sheep in my family. I had a brother who was three years older and was perfect. He's still perfect, um, which is, I've gotten used to it now. Um, and uh, I always loved to write, I always, lo I always loved to read, but I kind of went over to the dark side. My, my dad always jokes about Shakespeare, as a Shakespearean, um, there's a period in Shakespeare's life that they call the, the lost years or the dark years. He was very prolific and then he stopped writing for a long time and then he came back and he was prolific again. And my dad always sort of phrases, you know, frames my wild years of high school in the same way. You know, I was writing a little bit and then I disappeared and then I came back. Um, but luckily it gave me a lot of good material. I have yet to meet a YA author who really loved high school. They might exist, but I just haven't met any of them. Um, my, my quote from my senior yearbook was Pink Floyd. Um, the time is gone, the song is over, thought I'd something more to say. And the irony is that I hated high school so much that I intended to graduate and never look back and never think about it again. Um, I can remember sitting in the auditorium when we were graduating, there were all these people around me. I graduated the class of 88, which I know a lot of you weren't born yet, but don't tell me that, because that always gets me really depressed. Um, 
but there were people on either sides of me that were all crying and they were all nostalgic and they were like, 88 forever, we'll never forget. And I was just like, ugh, get me out of here, you know? I'm never going to think about any of you ever again. <laughs> so, but the ultimate irony is that I spend half of my day every day thinking about high school. So clearly there was a lot more material there than, than I anticipated. Um, I did write my first novel not realizing it was young adult. Uh, it had a 15-year-old narrator. I was just out of a college writing program where I had been encouraged to be very literary. And so when I finally got an agent interested and she said, well, this is young adult, I said, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm a serious writer. You know, little did I know. I was, I was a serious writer. I was also a waitress. Um, <laughs> But she said, just trust me. And she sold it to a children's book publisher. And that's how I became a young adult writer. And it is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Because those of you who write for teens or no teens who read know that it is just the most enthusiastic audience you could ever find. And the reason is that they are just connecting with books. They are just finding something of themselves on the page. I think what often happens with older readers like myself if we like a book, we're like, yay, this book's really good, and pass it around to my friends. Whereas the girls that read teen books and love them, like, shriek and jump up and down and put online reviews with a million exclamation points and burst into tears at signings. And, you know, I, my husband was on tour with me a couple of years ago, and this girl started crying in the signing line because she was so, it wasn't, I know it's not about me, it's about the books. And I just sort of represent the books. Um, but my husband was so, just rattled by this girl crying over me and he was just like patting her on the shoulder. He's like, she's nothing special, trust me. <laughs> if you only knew, you know, she doesn't wash the dishes right. She doesn't, you know, she always leaves things in the sink kind of thing. Um, but anyway, um, I feel very, very fortunate and young adult has changed so much since my first book came out in 1996 when literally there was no teen reader section. All young adult books were grouped with children's picture books. So it would be like my book and then Curious George and then, you know, and I didn't blame teenagers for not wanting to come into that section. Um, and as YA has gotten more popular and grown and then we had Harry Potter, then we had Twilight. I mean, I think everybody else is finally in on this great secret that I had known for a long time that Teenage readers are the best, they just are. And it, it's hard not to get a little proprietary when all these adult authors are suddenly coming in. It's like, hey, those are my people. Um, <laughs> but no, the more the merrier. I think anything that gets people to read is a wonderful thing. So I would love to take questions. We just need someone to be bold enough to raise their hand. Or I guess you're not raising your hand, you're coming to a microphone. There's a microphone here. I feel like we're in church, it's kind of like come ask a question. Oh, look, she's got a good, good job. You write about like a lot of traumatic stuff. Is it hard to go into that frame of mind when you try to write about that kind of stuff? The question is, is it hard to um, get in the frame of mind to write traumatic stuff? Um, I think it is and it isn't. Uh, usually by the time I'm getting to a very pivotal dramatic scene, I've really gotten to know my narrator. So I feel like I'm, I'm right there with her, but I've had a chance to build up to it. But it's definitely hard. My, uh, one of my books, Dreamland, was um, about a girl who gets into an abusive relationship. And that was definitely the hardest book to write in a lot of ways because I had to build up this character and then I had to bring her down to nothing and just kind of decimate her and then build her up again. And there were de times writing that book where I sort of had to go lay down for a few minutes. Um, it's also helpful if you have a dark, a really dark subject, if you have some lighter characters to take the pressure off and, and lighten things up a little bit. So I think you'll see if I'm, if I'm dealing with a dark subject, I often will have some supporting characters that are more comical, which, um, which just helps to lighten the mood a little bit. I'm gonna alternate, so yes. Um, in some of your later books, you bring back characters. So like in Along for the Ride, you bring back Jason from uh, whatever happened to Goodbye, right. and Isabel, and someone else from like um, Keeping the Moon. Mm -hmm. So was it like going back to old friends, or were you like, ah, I need them back? Right. I, I started bringing people back into the books because I had so many requests for sequels. 
I think um, there's so many great series, as we all know, um, up for teens, and uh, teens have gotten very used to knowing what happens after the book ends, and they, want, they wanted sequels. But I don't think, I think there are a lot of people that write very good sequels. I just worry that I'm not one of them. Um, so I brought a character back from Someone Like You, my second book, to into this lullaby just as a like a thank you for all of the girls who had read my books and been so devoted and so excited and I just wanted to you know for us to have a little inside joke um, but then it became something that people expected me to do so I started doing it in every book and now it's become very challenging because people ex I always think I'm being really tricky with the, the things that I hide in there and then the, the day the book comes out somebody's on Wikipedia you know listing every single one of them I, I always think I'm so much sneakier than I really am. Um, but I like it. I mean, I like the sense of community in my books. I like the idea that, because I grew up in a, in a pretty small town. I still live there, you know, and, and I see how my life is in, still interlocked with a lot of the same people. Um, even if I'm not friendly with them anymore, I will see, like, the boy I had a crush on in seventh grade and, like, just wanted to kill myself. I loved him so much and he didn't know who I was. And, and now I see him at the gas station and he's got like two kids in the back and you know, we're just all, it, it's just, things keep crisscrossing with each other. And so I like that in the books as well. And then sometimes it's, it's for my own sanity. Um, like in Just Listen, I was having a lot of trouble writing Just Listen. And when I brought Remy and Dexter back from this lullaby just for a short scene, I just wanted to go out the door with them. I was, I was just like, I hate this book that I'm writing and I'm just gonna leave with them. Whatever they're doing has gotta be better than this. Um, so there's a, there's a little bit of danger to it as well. Where was I? I think I'm over here, yes. Hi, Sarah. Um, I'm actually on the older end of your readers, as you can probably see. Um, I've been reading your books since I was you know, in middle school. Um, but I feel as an older reader, I can say I love your shoes. And oh, I thank just you. wanted to know how your feet are feeling. <laughs> The question is, how are my feet feeling? Well, these are my book tour shoes, which um, people who read my blog know that I, I buy a new pair of shoes for every book tour. Um, and I got these back in April. So I'm actually pretty used to wearing them. But um, when I'm at home, I don't dress like this. And I never, if you see me at, at the Whole Foods in Chapel Hill, which is pretty much the center of my universe, I'm there every day. Um, I'm wearing flip flops always. but. Um, it's kind of fun. I feel like I have two sides to my life, and I think a lot of the, the moms here in particular can probably relate to this. You know, when I'm home, I have a four-year-old with my daughter. I'm, you know, making pancakes in the morning, and I'm looking for stuffed animals, and I'm filling up water bottles to take to school. And then I come here and look at this, all these people, and it's fantastic, and I get to wear fancy shoes. But I fly home tonight, and I'll be you know, cutting up grapes in a few hours, and, and nobody will think I'm special at all. <laughs> that's, uh, that's why I always want to bottle, like when I get to go on book tour and people say such nice things to me, I wish I could just bottle it for those days when my daughter is like kicking and screaming on the floor, you know. See, some people think I'm awesome, you know. <laughs> but, um, but yes, my feet are fine right now, but um, we'll see, ask me again in a couple of hours. I got to ride a golf cart here, which made me feel so important, let me tell you. <laughs> Yes. Okay, um, this is kind of a quirky question, but I'm rereading this. It's probably the best book you've ever written. Oh my gosh, you. thank you. And um, <laughs> like, I wonder what the inspiration for the Burt Mobile was. The, <laughs> the, Burt, the Burt Mobile? Yeah. Um, Burt, for those of you who haven't read The Truth About Forever, uh, there's a character named Burt, and when he gets his license, he buys a used ambulance um, for his car, and that's what he wants, and so that's what he gets. Um, well, it was sort of inspired by the fact that when I was a teenager in Chapel Hill, there were these guys that had a hearse, and I don't know where they got it, but they bought it, and, and it was their car, and they drove around in it, and they, they just treated it with, like they had fuzzy dice hanging from, you know, and they would often like have a lot of people in the back of the hearse, and then they would open it up, and people would come piling out. Um, but I just, it seemed to fit Bert also as a character for me, and uh I think, I think again, Bird is one of those characters I could have a lot of fun with because he was, you can't have a really way too quirky, crazy main character because nobody will really buy it. So that's why I have so much fun with the, with the ones on the side, for sure. Yeah, there's also like in Lock and Key, there's the 12 year old like Jervis or right. something and like he's in high school and he takes public classes and it's just weird. Yeah. It's always it's fun to have the, the, the odd little characters on the side. Um, 
I enjoy, I, normal people are boring to me, and so I, I prefer the quirky people. I have this big poll right here, so if you see me doing this, it's just because I can't see the person asking the question. Go ahead. Is there some kind of condition you like to write in, and if you do, does it ever help when you get writer's block? A condition. Um, <laughs> is there a condition I like to write in? I'm very um, routine oriented, and when I first started writing, regularly, I was waiting tables, and I had another job in the morning. So I would, you know, get up in the morning, go to my other job, come back, write in the afternoons from three to five, and then go wait tables, and then come home and start it all over again. So um, I write in the afternoons. I always have to have two pieces of chocolate before I write. That's not really necessary, but I think it is. So <laughs> I have two pieces of chocolate, and I do really well. Um, I can't I do better if I'm in a room where there, I can't look at anything or do anything. My first um, office in this little yellow farmhouse we lived in, I literally faced the wall. And it was a really dark room with one window that let in no light. Um, I don't trust myself to not get distracted. I love the romantic idea of going to Starbucks and writing the great American novel. But every time I go to Starbucks to write, I just like look at the pastries and don't do anything. You know. I need to not have anything um, to distract me. And as far as the writer's block, I think I don't even I don't even call it writer's block. I just call it like writing. You know, for me, whenever I finish a book, I, I never want to write another book ever because I'm just sick of it. Um, and then I take a little time off and I watch a lot of Bravo and I just kind of do my thing. And then I start to get a little itchy and I need to get back to work. So. I start writing, and usually the first, I want to say about the first 50 pages of any novel are so fun and so great because I haven't written in a while, and it's all potential, and I can do whatever I want. But then about from page 50 to about page 300 and something, it's really hard. And then that's 300 to maybe, you know, 400 or whatever is like going down the roller coaster because you've done all the work to get to the top, and then it gets to be fun again. So. If I get stuck, I usually go back to the last place where it was working and take another route. But writing is hard. I like to be very honest about that. I don't like it when I hear authors say, oh, you know, I just glide to the computer and the muse sings. And No, you know, I mean, I, I would much rather be watching The Real Housewives most days than writing, but <laughs> I have to write. And once I get started, it's, it's you know, I wouldn't rather, I wouldn't want to do anything else. Yes. Hi. Um No, that's me. I was breathing too heavy. Okay. That's why I was like, okay. Um, the characters in this lullaby seem really unique to me. Are any of those characters based on real people you've met? Are the characters in this lullaby based on people that I've met? Not really. Um, I wrote that book after I had actually written another book that I wasn't really happy with. My publisher liked it, and they wanted to buy it. And um, I remember I sent it off, and they, they gave me this long you know, editorial letter, like, well, we love it, but you need to fix this, 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 this. And that happens with every book, because my first drafts are usually awful. But for some reason, I just was like, I don't want to work on this book. And I took it back, which is unheard of, because I said, I just don't want to sell it. I don't, I don't want this to be my next book. And then I just took some time off, and I wrote this lullaby. Um, and I, I think I wrote it for me, was the one thing. I, I wasn't trying to think about anybody else. Um, and also, I think that the character, especially Remy, is unique because she's the least like me of any of my characters. I mean, I wish I was Remy at, in high school and now um, in terms of just the confidence and carrying herself so well and being able to solve any problem. I, I mean, that's the kind of person I wish I was. Um, as far as Dexter, a lot of people always want to know if Dexter is based on a real person. He really was a mix of all the boys that I loved in high school. Um, I was never into the captain of the football team, although I'm sure they're great, or the student body president. I'm sure he was fine, too. But I always liked the kind of dorky, quirky, clumsy guys. Um, so I, I took all the best qualities. That's the nice thing about writing and kind of made him. But his name, just so you know, um, I took from a local musician in Chapel Hill named Dexter Romweber, who played with a band called the Flat Duo Jets. And now he's, he's still around. He's older than me. He has like a million bands. And um, my husband knows someone who knows him. And so my husband was like, oh, you know, Dexter might come over some night. And I was like, no. I was like, I just can't. Like the, the inspiration for Dexter in my house, I would just die. I don't think I could handle it. And I'm sure he doesn't know, nor would he care. I'm sure he doesn't read my books. But 
Um, if, you're, if you're from Chapel Hill, you probably have heard of Dexter or Ron Weber, so that's where I got the name from. Yes? Well, you're a really good author, I think. I just started reading one of your books, Just Listen, and I thought the idea was so original. I wanted to know where you got your ideas. Uh, the idea for Just Listen. Um, well, really, Just Listen came, I had sort of some idea in my head, but um, actually I was doing a speaking engagement at a school in North Carolina, and I was sitting in the little waiting room waiting for to go on stage, and they had, you know how a lot of times they'll have yearbooks out at a school, and I opened up the yearbook and I was flipping through, and there were all these senior pages at the back where students could put their own personal pictures or whatever. Um, and there was this picture of these three girls sitting in front of a beautiful house with a swimming pool. Beautiful girls, obviously sisters. And I just remember looking at that picture and thinking, oh, their lives must just be so perfect. And then in the next line thinking, why in the world would I assume that? Just because they're pretty? Just because they have a nice house? Just because they have a pool? You know, I mean, that does not necessarily mean that anything is, is good there or everything is good there. So it really got me thinking about the assumptions that we all make. And I already sort of had an idea in my head for Annabelle, and I thought, well, why not make her one of these beautiful girls that comes from a beautiful family and a beautiful house, but inside there's a lot of darkness. Um, and so that's, that's where the, the beginning of that story came from. Okay. <laughs> yes? Well, do you have inspiration for writing like an author in the past? Do you like, was it like a, a, a person who inspired you to write? Absolutely. Um, the question is, do, are there authors that inspire me? Um, all the time. But I think when I was a teenager, I read a lot of Judy Bloom. No, I'm not the first person. Yes, let's have a hand for Judy Bloom. <laughs> Um, and for those of you who don't know who Judy Bloom is, shame on you, for starters. But secondly, um, she just wrote books that no one else was writing when I was a teenager. She wrote about things nobody else was writing about. And, and it was just like blowing your mind open. Like, here's somebody who thinks the same thing that I think, but think I can't say aloud. Um, so I read a lot of Judy Bloom. I loved Lois Lowry. I read a lot of Southern fiction because, okay, yay, Lois Lowry. Um, um, I was from North Carolina, and I lived in a very writer-rich area, still do, Chapel Hill. So I, I was lucky enough to be able to read authors and then go hear them speak or even see them at the grocery store. And I really think it made it more real to me that I could be an author. Because I think a lot of times, you know, you only think of authors as dead people on the back of books. Like, you know, no offense to Shakespeare, but he is dead, you know, and <laughs> all that kind of thing. Um, so to meet real authors and to see that there are actual people that do this and are out able to do this, I think was a, was a huge part for me. And I actually got to meet Judy Bloom a couple of years ago at, um, at a conference. And I made just the biggest fool out of myself because I just could not contain like how excited I was. And I have this one picture. I have one picture of me with Judy Bloom and she looks beautiful and regal and totally great. And I'm like, <laughs> I just, I mean, seriously, it's so embarrassing. Um, but I just, I, I couldn't even put into words how much her books had meant to me growing up. It was just like this light going on in this dark place. Like, it's, it's not just you, you're okay. So I, I, I can only hope that someone reads my books and thinks that as well. Yes? Um, have any moments in your life ever inspired you to write? Have any moments in my life ever inspired me oh yeah I think so um, I don't put a lot of my personal life into my books usually it's more of a jumping off point I tend to think if you write a lot about yourself that it's I don't know it's kind of boring my regular life is really boring um, but I do tend to take things that have happened and turned them into things when I was uh, in ninth grade actually um, the most popular boy in my school like the boy that all the girls wanted to date and all the boys wanted to be was killed in a motorcycle accident. And I always think back to that as being, it was the first time somebody I knew that was my age had died and how it sort of just shook me where I stood because I think there are certain people that you, you know are going to die, like your, your grandparents and elderly people and stuff, but for someone that was sitting next to you in math class two days ago and then they're just gone. Um, and I, I remember that having a big impact on me, and I always wanted to write something about it. So when I started my book, Someone Like You, that was the jumping off point. But I didn't want to write about him. I just wanted to write about how that event sort of became a before and after. Um, 
And now that I'm older, um, and I'm not in high school anymore, uh, I, I tend to be able to work my personal experiences into the older characters. If you read Along for the Ride, the stepmother Heidi, who has the, the newborn baby that won't stop crying. I had a newborn baby that was crying a lot when I was writing that book. So I was sort of writing Heidi the kind of comfort that I was wishing I had. <laughs> um, and, um, and just the, the, all the new mom craziness. So uh, there's definitely a lot of me in the books, but hopefully nobody would be able to pick out specifically what but me. Yes? Have you ever fallen asleep one day and woken up the next day and been like, idea? <laughs> I just love how you asked that question. <laughs> idea. I wish that that would happen to me. Um, but I have to say, I do get the best ideas when I'm not trying to think of them. Um, the more that I try to force my writing, if I'm like driving down the street with my kid in the back going to Whole Foods, okay, okay, what am I gonna do? I gotta write, I gotta figure this out. It, it never works. It's always when I'm, you know, out feeding my chickens and I'm like, oh, go, you know, it, it'll just come from nowhere. I don't know if anybody else ever saw, this is such so random, but anybody else ever see that movie called Turner and Hooch with Tom Hanks? And there's that scene where he's been trying to figure something out and trying to figure something out, and then all of a sudden he's in the kitchen and he figures it out, and he's like, ah, and he's like hitting all the pots and pans and just freaking out. That's, that's what it's like for me. Um, but it, it, if I try too hard to plan, it never works. I have a lot of books in my closet that nobody will ever see that were books that I forced or books that failed or books that just were not, I mean, I've spent nine months on a book and sent it to my agent to have her say, sorry, this isn't your next book. And it's kind of brutal. And go eat a lot of ice cream, cry a little bit, you know, and then go back to the drawing board. Yes. Kate, um, my question is about your experience of seeing your work adapted for a movie. And I think a lot of authors maybe have the experience of seeing like one novel adapted to one movie, but I just wondered what your experience was of having your how to deal with like a composite of right. two of your books right. and like your thoughts on what they chose from each book and how it fit together into like an amalgam of like those two books. Right. Uh, the question is about um, when my what it was like when two of my books were put into one screenplay for How to Deal, which came out in 2003. Um, I had no control over that, which is usually the case with authors um, when your book is adapted. I felt very lucky that anyone was interested. And when they called me up and said, well, we, we like all these elements in both books. We think we're going to put them together in one screenplay. What do you think? I was like, well, I don't, I'm glad I don't have to do it because they're two totally distinct books. Um, but it, and it is sort of a weird thing. I mean, the, the movie was not, of course, completely faithful to the books as, as of course, we would want it to be. but. You know, I, I have learned that so many of my favorite, favorite books have been made into movies that I wasn't necessarily fond of, but it didn't make me like the book any less. So I kind of went into it with that attitude. Like, my favorite book in the world is A Prayer for Owen Meany by John Irving. I know. Yes. Thank you. And it was made into a movie called Simon Birch, which was not a very good movie. No offense to anybody if, if you like it, but it wasn't. I mean, I don't think you could make a movie that was as good as A Prayer for Owen Meany. I just don't think you could. Um, so I had, to, I had sort of a choice to make about how far along I wanted to go with it. I could have stepped back and said, it's not like my book, and I don't want anything to do with it, and I'm going to take my toys and go home. Or I could just kind of go along for the ride, literally, and enjoy it and just see what happened. And so that's kind of what I did. And, you know, there's, n there's really nothing bad about having Mandy Moore on the cover of your book. Like, <laughs> nothing. I mean, I remember I was at the Los Angeles Times Book Festival, and it was right before the movie came out. We had the tie-ins for, um, for the movie with Mandy on the cover. First of all, I was at this festival, and Strawberry Shortcake had been reading before me at where I was reading. And so I came, and everyone was very disappointed that Strawberry Shortcake was not there anymore. So I spent most of the time I was sitting there explaining why I wasn't Strawberry Shortcake to everybody and really disappointed people. Um, but then the Penguin rep that was with me said, oh, you know what, we have these... Nobody was stopping to talk to me. It was so pathetic. And um, she's like, we have these Mandy Moore things. We should put them out and just see what happens. And so we put them out, and it was just like this gravitational force. People would be walking by, and they'd see Mandy Moore, and they'd just come, you know. Oh, who are you? And like, oh, there's my book with Mandy Moore. <laughs> so um, I really do think it, it, that and the movie, and the fact that the movie is still running on Oxygen and Lifetime sometimes, 
it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous thing for me. And, you know, I don't kid myself that it, it gave my books a big boost and got them to a bigger audience. I was at the premiere of How to Deal, and I had a chance for this photo op with Mandy Moore. And, um, you know, she's tall and gorgeous and amazing, and I just am, like, not. So I was like, ooh. But um, I was getting my picture taken, and she said, oh, well, I heard the book's selling really well. Congratulations. And I said, oh, well, it's just because you're on the cover. And, and she said, oh, I'm sure that's not true. And I said, oh, I think we both know that's true. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I love Mandy Moore, and she made a lot of things possible for me. So everything in my house that, you know, the movie made possible, we thank Mandy Moore. We're like, thank you, Mandy, for our refrigerator. Thank you for... I'll be a Mandy Moore fan for life, for sure. Yes? Where do I get the inspiration to write tragic tales? Um, well, I think life is just tragic sometimes. I mean, I never set out thinking I'm going to write a book about a set issue, because I, I think that that's sort of backwards. Um, I'm not going to sit down and say, OK, I'm going to write a book about a girl who is sexually assaulted. Let's see. Hmm. You know, I mean, it's more that this idea comes to my head, like with Just Listen and Annabelle. Oh, she's this beautiful girl. There's some darkness there. What could the darkness be? Well, maybe she went to a party and X, Y, Z happened. Um, I, I think that I remember years ago that my books were the only, some of the only books in like my publisher's catalog that had happy endings. Um, that uh, YA was very, very dark for a very, very long time. And I remember people saying, your books are you know, so uplifting. And I'm like, well, I just, I like a happy ending. If I invest a lot of time in reading a book, I don't want to be insanely depressed by the time it's all over. I can be insanely depressed wa watching the news, you know? Um, so I tend to, you know, I try to temper it, like I said earlier, with the, um, with the comic moments and the darker moments. It's just a balance. I mean, that's what life is. You have good days and bad days. You have highs and lows. And in a good book, you have all of those things as well. Yes? How do you come up with the titles for your books? How do I come up with the titles for my books? Um, well, everyone is different. Um, most of my books have had other titles in my mind the entire time I was writing them. And then I send them to New York, and everybody hates my titles. And so then I have to come up with another title. And I'm always really bitter about it. Like, I remember The Truth About Forever was originally called, um, it's called The Forever. I understand. It's not a good title. But at the time, I really liked it. And um, I had all these ideas about it, and, and nobody liked it. And Penguin you know, kept asking me. And finally, I, I came up with a few titles that they liked. And then I still had The Forever on the list. And I wrote it on an index card. And I carried it everywhere I went. So I would be like at Whole Foods. And I'd say, which one of these do you like to the cashier? Nobody picked my title, not a single person. It's always like, oh, no, we like that one better. It's like, ugh. Um, so I've almost, as a joke or just as an interesting experiment for my next book, I want to give it just like the stupidest title in the world and have another title in the back of my head so that when they say we don't like the title, I can suggest the title I actually want and maybe they'll be like, brilliant. Because sometimes I think people just like to be involved in it. Um, but there are certain books, like this lullaby, I knew the title from because the first line is the name of the song is this lullaby. So there you go, perfect. Um, Keeping the Moon, I didn't have an idea until the very end. And then when Norman tells the story about seeing the eclipse, the lunar eclipse, and thinking as a child that they were keeping the moon. There are just some moments that you, you, hit, you hear a title, and it just is like, ooh, that's good. Um, Lock and Key, I think, was originally called. See, now I'm not even going to be able to remember what it was called. It had another name, too. And then I thought of lock and key, and it was just perfect. It's just you just know. Um, it's kind of like finding the right pair of shoes or you know, the right dress. It's like, oh, as my friend Dana, who is my fashion advisor, says, it speaks to you. <laughs> These shoes spoke to me. Um, and the title kind of speaks to you, too, I think. Yes? Have, ha, like, write a book with somebody else, have, like, a co-writer. You know, I've been asked to do that before, and I think, on the one hand, it would be really fun, but I am such a control freak that I just don't think I could. I mean, there are so many great series like that, like um, John Green and David Levitan did Will Grayson, Will Grayson, and Rachel Cohn and David Levitan. Um, I, 
I am so crazy when I'm writing that my husband can't even stand to be around me, and he, he supposedly loves me. So I can't imagine that if I was, had like someone who was not married to me that had to be right there through the whole process that they would be able to handle it. Um, and I, I am kind of a control freak. It would be hard for me to hand off a book to somebody else, but never say never. Um, I, I tend to, I like to keep my crazy all to myself. Um, I've learned that works better for everybody. Yes. Hi, I'm a young adult author myself, and I was just wondering, like, when you're going through the whole publishing and editing process, like, how do you get through that? Is it a really long wait? Um, sort of, how does it happen? Well, I was lucky um, in many ways. Um, I was writing a lot, and I was working for a local author in Chapel Hill who let me um, send out. Uh, query letters, and a query letter is where you write, this is before the internet, that's how old I am. Um, a query letter is a letter where you say, this is, I wrote this book and it's about this and you should publish it. And um, I sent out to agents for about, a, uh, for about a year, she watched me send out and get rejected. I had a couple of nibbles. I had one woman that kept my manuscript for about three months and then said she didn't want it. And um, I had what I called my summer of rejection which was like just a particular heavy summer of getting rejected over and over again. And I had this long driveway, because we lived out in the country, and I would walk down to the end of the driveway, pull my rejection letters out of the mailbox, read them, and then give myself the entire length of the driveway to feel really sorry for myself all the way up to the house. And so I would just walk up and I'd be like, this is stupid, you know, I went, I went to school for so long and now I'm waiting tables and I don't like my hair and I stink and it's like life sucks and uh, you know. And sometimes my husband would drive past me going up the driveway and just ignore me because he knew that what I was doing. But the rule was as soon as I got back up to the house, I had to send out another letter. And um, you have to get the thick skin going. So I did that for about a year and then finally um, M Lee Smith, who I was working for, sent m one of my books, which was never published, to her agent. And they took me on and they said, we hear you have this other book that you've written. And I said, yeah, but it's not very good at all. And they said, oh, no, no, just send it so we have a sense of what you can do. And I sent it and they said, this is young adult. And I was like, oh, I don't know, just trust me. And so that's how it happened for me. Um, and, and I feel, I'm still with that same agent who told me to trust her all those years ago. So, I mean, it is, it, and it's changed. I feel like I can't give good advice about getting published now because the whole publishing, I mean, this was 1994. I mean, everything has changed. There's so many more resources available and there's self-publishing and there's email queries and the whole thing. I mean, I think the number one thing is, the best advice I can give you, which I think is timeless, and I still follow this, is you have to keep the, the shopping your work separate from your work. Like, the best thing you can do when you get rejected is to sit down and write. So the two are not connected at all um, in your mind. And I still do that. If I get a bad review, I make myself go sit down and write. Just like, one is not the other. What I'm doing is over here, and what everybody else thinks about it is over here. Um, and if the, you let the two get all tangled up, you're done. So you really just have to, those days of rejection are the most important writing days, always. Oh, yes. Um, feel like to be an author, like going from tour to tour all the time? Is it like stressful? Is it um, happy? <laughs> What's it like being on book tour? Um, well, it's changed a bit for me since I had my daughter. I used to go out and do like three weeks and I'd be gone. Um, and I really miss my dogs and my husband, but I could still do it. And then I had a baby and I was like, that's not happening anymore. Um, so it's, it's great. It's exhausting. But I think because writing is so solitary, and for the time that I'm not doing things like this, I'm at home in front of my computer writing alone, um, surfing the internet too much, um, that it's so nice to go out and see the people that read the books and see people react to them. I mean, that's what makes the work worthwhile. And so I think people who don't tour and who don't go out and meet their readers are, are really missing out, because that's, that's what I think of when I'm having these awful days, you know, where I just, the writing is not happening and I'm frustrated and I'm ready to just bag it all and go do something else with my life. I think about these girls that say, when's the next book coming out? When's the next book coming out? I was just in Toronto for two days. I've never done book stuff up there. And they were so excited and it just made me think, wow, you know, I mean, all the way up here, there are all these people that just can't wait for the next book. So I need to stop whining and get to work. Um, and it is fun and you definitely, you don't get to see much. It's like, People say, oh, you went to Denver, and you went to Miami, and what'd you do? And I'm like, well, I was in the airport. 
and then I was at the bookstore, and then I was at the hotel, and then I was at the airport again. It's always kind of like, oh, look, there's the Mall of America. Oh, look, there's Daytona Speedway, which you don't really get to see much. Um, see, here I am in DC, and I'm not going to get to see all that much, but I got to come back another time, enjoy myself. Yes. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, in your book, Just Listen, when um, Owen says silence is so freaking loud, where did you get the inspiration for that? Because that's so true. <laughs> Owen says, uh, silence is so freaking loud. Well, I, I knew so much of the, I wanted so much of the book to be about, you know, what we say and what we don't say, what we hear and what we don't hear. Owen is a fan of music, so he deals with a lot of his issues by filling his head with music. And I, so I think it would make sense that, you know, in silence, you're sort of forced to be with yourself. Um, this is why I am, I am terrible at yoga and meditation, you know, it's like when I meditate, I'm like thinking about my grocery list and I'm like thinking about everything I have to do. I'm, it's very hard to be in that centered moment. So I think that's probably what I was thinking about. <laughs> I don't have a lot of silence in my life now that I have a four-year-old though. So I don't know, maybe a little silence might be nice once in a while. I think this has to be my last question and we're winding down. Yes. Of all the books you've written, which one is your favorite? Which one is my favorite? See, I get asked this a lot, and it's so hard to answer. I feel like it's like picking my favorite dog. You know, I have two dogs, so I have one child, so she's my favorite, of course. Um, <laughs> she'll never have to go through that thing that I went through with my mom, like, who's your favorite? Well, you both are. No, that's not possible. Um, my brother was the favorite. Everybody knows it anyway. Um, but I, I think some of my books I just have affection for because they were easier to write but that doesn't mean I'm less connected to them. Um, Along for the Ride and This Lullaby were kind of the more fun books to write. This Lullaby in particular was like going to a party every day. So I have a real soft spot for that one. Um, but I also really love, you know, all the ones that were incredibly hard. The Truth About Forever is a book that was so hard to write. Um, but that, that's why I feel so proud of it and why I'm so touched when people come up and tell me how much they like it because I know that it did not come easy. Um, I, 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 my old answer to that question was my favorite book is the one I haven't started yet because it's still perfect in my mind. Because before I start, I always think I've got it all worked out. This is gonna be the one that I just click right through, no problems, I'm not gonna hit any walls, it's all great. And then I get to page 51 and you know, straight, straight down as always. How, how am I doing? Do I have, I have a little bit more time maybe for one more question? Okay, one more question. Last question, no pressure. Hi, is there a certain book of yours that you can relate most to? Is there a certain book that I can relate the most to? Um, well, like I said, they all are a little bit about me. So what's nice for me is that I can flip, I never reread my books. Somebody asked me that the other day and I was like, no. You're so sick of a book by the time you finish writing, editing, promoting. But they each represent a certain part of my life to me. But I always say that the character who is the most like I was in high school is Haley from Someone Like You. Um, and I think I, I definitely see more of myself in her because I was so much that kind of girl in high school. I had a very close relationship with, with my mom and then I had to break away with her, break away from her a little bit to come back. And... Um, I had a very dynamic best friend who I sort of trailed along behind, but I was never the dynamic one myself. So um, I'm always gonna have a soft spot for Haley, for sure. She's kind of me at 18. And I think Remy is who I wish I was. Haley is who I really was. Not that they're not both awesome, because they are. Well, I hope you guys will come to the signing tent. I'm gonna be signing and um, come say hello. And thank you so much for coming out. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.